And welcome back, everybody, to our latest Q&A episode. I'm joined by my colleague, as always, who will be asking me uh, your questions, because we, we finally have some to, to, to answer from you all. So thank you for sending those in, and uh, do remember that you can continue to send your questions in, and we will get to them in our future episodes. So uh, off we go, then. Yes, much obliged. Um, so, uh, as we... Uh... As we explore the uh, the town of Esperanza, yes, yes, is that where we are? Which uh, means mm-hmm. hope, as this uh, former sailor at the bar has just told us. Yes, no, that's uh, that's excellent. I did, did not know that one. Oh, right, playing through, um, but uh, it's just lack of research. So, uh, hopping into the questions. Um, so this one is so um, this one's a nice general one. So, who was your favourite character to write? and or portray uh my favorite character to write and portray out of all of the stuff that i've done um well the easiest is my least favorite to remember but uh, no my my favorite uh would be um oh uh that's a difficult one it i mean you could frame that i suppose as either looking back who do you hold most fondly in your memory or who was the most fun at the time um Hmm. I think I rec- th- think in the questions here. I think it might. Ha- I think I have to exclude Reb from all across. Fair enough. Um, I think yeah, that was it. That was uh, I remember when reading this that I was to exclude Reb from this. That's why I'm struggling to <laughs> to to. Oh, gotcha. Sorry, it's, it's all right. Don't worry. It was it was further down in the in, in our, yourself in your question. No, 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 no. In our yeah, side parameters. notes here, we, you may note, notice that we have excluding Reb metal. Uh, is written. Um, so uh, you know what? That's that's my fault. I did not scroll that's, far. That's enough. quite all right. No problem. Um, fits with our moniker. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's let's think here. Um, uh, I rec- I reckon my favorite character to to write slash portray has got to go to. Um, Lord Ravishing <laughs> from Last Stop. Actually, out of all the the characters I've, I've I've played and whatnot, excluding Reb, I think Reb would have been would have probably been my my choice there um, because uh, he he was just so much much fun uh, to do. Nothing deep, mm. nothing particularly interesting about him, honestly. And honestly, I think he's one of those characters that's very easily forgettable for anyone who's watched the show or our shows in general. Um, mm. But he was. But I think just when I was doing the dialogue for him, as little as he has, uh, and, and 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 doing, and then actually going to perform him, it was the fact that uh, the the cast of Last Stop. This was the first time they'd properly worked with me on a on a fi- on a film piece in in person, no less. I should say. Um, mm. And uh, th- I remember the first time I did a Lord Ravishing line, they all just sort of froze, and uh, and just. You know, looked at me, and I said, "Okay, next, next, next take. Who's next on screen?" And and we just moved on from there. And I just thought, well, I suppose that probably scared them all because I'm normally a fairly quiet <laughs> individual. And I, I think, I think it was a bit where I, I look out from behind behind a tree or something, and I and I, I I say something very loudly. I shake my fist. I whirl my cape and fluff my hair and all the rest of it, and then walk away behind the tree again or something. I think it was something like that. And. Uh, mm. They all just froze and were une- it was unexpected, I believe, for them. So yes. there you go. Well, they will remember him if no one else. Yes, and also he'll be well remembered by Lady Kabuki, whose mask he stole. Now, I just want to, 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 to in his defence, he didn't steal that mask. Uh, he is from the same demon tribe that the, the demon inside uh, 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 that oh. possessed. Uh, what's her name? Jenny. Apologies, heaven profound. It's, uh, you'll notice that the, the, the gems on it are a slightly different pallor, and it's not because of the different colour effects in the, the screen. Right. <laughs> no, there were, there, were, there, were two, there were actually two masks made to, to, for, um, for Kabuki. One with drained energy gem look after it had been cut in two, and the other one mm. with, um, with more energized colorful purple gems uh, on them and uh, he wears the, the 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 one that wasn't used at the end so right. there you go ah, excellent um 
Okay, I'll be yes. I'll, I'll take care to exclude red metal where uh, where appropriate um, <laughs> yes. from uh, from the or from my own if I if, if it's uh, relevant. You but, would probably um, win all of these favorite questions, unfortunately, because I'm very biased about Sky Pirates, as we all know from this game that we're now playing. Yes, yes, we're spreading the word. Um, okay, uh, hopping over from from Sky Pirates to some ninja action um, mm. because uh, some. Uh, some of the stuff uh, I'd like to, to probe has uh, come from reminding myself about certain earlier aspects of the, of the Ninja series. Cause ah, I, right. I, my my close work with uh, with that particular show has uh, has meant there aren't too many blind spots for me. But every every once in a while, something will come up that I either don't remember uh, as fully as I thought I did, or that or where there's just just enough. Of a, of a blank in my memory that I think there's there must be something worth mining there. Um, right. On this occasion, I uh, I got reminded of the possibility in in season two that uh, that season one characters Hime and Leon might actually have have made an appearance, and there was actually some material filmed of them. For, ah, uh, for yes, season two. yes, there was, wasn't there? Yes. Um, now. Uh, that material, it's kind of ambiguous whether that material is complete or not, so I wonder if you could expand on what the plan was for them within the context of season two and where the scene, more was intended. Yeah, I think I know the scene you're meaning. Um, hmm. I, I recall we even filmed opening footage uh, for, uh, for on that day of, of film. I think it was just one day. Yes, hmm. it was. You were there, I, I remember, actually. And, I was, yeah. And uh, I, I believe you... Oh gosh! Yeah, I remember this very well now. Um, Go on, right? Because uh, I don't remember what I did. Okay, well, n- well, no, it's it's perfectly in keeping with with your character that you were playing. Uh, so, sure, but, sure. Uh, it was. It's. I just laughed there when I remembered how, how we'd had it, and perhaps this was maybe a, a, a dip into how Alzek became more like in in the spinoff. Uh, without realizing it myself, um, or, or of course it was before the spinoff was even thought of, I believe. So, uh, okay. Um, I think uh, basically for, for everyone who, who's listening here, uh, I'll try and start this in the beginning so it's not too difficult to understand. Um, during season two, uh, it's largely just uh, Dine and Galron and Alzek are the three returning characters uh, proper from from season one and. Um, Galron is in it, uh, probably. He's, he's he's definitely in it, uh, a good portion of it, but not as much as we would have wanted him to be, obviously, just because of filming availability. Hmm. Uh, Alzek and Dine um, take up probably the most, um, you know, dialogue, important dialogue screen time, especially in the later half of the series. Uh, mm-hmm. Al- Alzek was originally to be regulated to be, um, to have lesser screen time, as the story would have focused more on uh, Dine and Halleck, particularly Halleck, as we all know, um, that all changed as, as well. Um, so th- this was, um, uh, d- this Leon and Hime stuff that we're talking about, th- this was the idea to bring them back in in the last two or three episodes, uh, not dissimilar to how they only appeared in the last two episodes of, of season one. Mm. Um uh, and have them uh, interact with the the school, and you know, just to, to see how they were doing, and you know, what was going on. And, and by that point, we'd finalized that dead nin were a thing, um, because originally they they weren't. Um, I think I think uh, they, they they weren't as meant to be. Yeah, definitely, because originally the season two was meant to be Jin as the final boss, and all the rest of it was the, the Halleck story, basically for, for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think possibly because Dead Nin was mentioned and Jin was a member, etc. I, th- I think that the idea was to maybe launch into a third series to do the Dead Nin thing. So in a sense, we we combined all of those ideas into that. And I wanted to bring Leon and Hime back into it uh, so that uh, they could be they could assist against Dead Nin essentially. And I think that's you know a, a perfect idea because of you know Leon being as powerful as he is, and well, no, why would why wouldn't Dine call on Leon to come and? <laughs> You know, assist in this uh, this battle. Mm. Um, uh, so the idea was to have, um, uh, I believe, uh, Hime was at that point in the script, uh, or lack thereof, or, or bullet points, or whatever it was I was doing at the time. She was supposed to be, I think, queen of the Wood Country at that oh. point. I think she descended to the the throne because a good number of years has passed since season one, obviously, and. Um, 
And Leon was still a rogue. Um, he certainly was dressed like one anyway in, in that filming. Um, yeah. But he, I, th- I think he was probably like supposed to... It, it was never... It remember that none of this was ever fully cemented, but to, to the best of my, my memory here, Leon was still coming and going as he pleased in the Wood Country Castle, although we, we didn't know there was a castle proper or what it looked like at that point mm. until the spin-off, obviously. But yes. um, the idea was that Hime had ascended the throne and that Leon was essentially her silent protector who would appear as need be and no one had a problem with a rogue because he was like the, you know, the well-known... You know, former knight of the of the the castle, etc. So he was fine to be coming and going, and possibly even staying there hmm. as well. So so that was that. Um, yeah. But he wasn't always there, and I know that the way the story was going was that Alzac was dispatched from the ninja school to go and uh, bodyguard uh, protect the princess uh, as she traveled to the the ninja school to to enter into talks of possibly an alliance between the royal family and their. Uh, body, uh, their bodyguards or soldiers or whatever they would have had, you yes. know, in, uh, okay. in that yep. f- form of the narrative that was still being constructed at the time. Um, and uh, Alzac was dispatched to do this. And I remember the the very first bit of filming we did to bring Hime and Leon back into it was Alzac and Hime are walking along, um, and uh, Alzac fails at his bodyguard <laughs> mission to to protect uh, t- uh, the princess, and uh, she's captured by. I think three nameless henchmen, um, one of whom is actually played by Stephen, who yes. played Leon. But that was um, <laughs> he wasn't supposed to be Leon or anything. But that, yeah, so that's that's what that scene rings about. For yeah, I don't no, think that I, ever I got think used. I know what you're talking about roughly, and the, the entire premise. I mean, obviously, we were knee deep in making what was essentially a ninja sketch show by that point, um, but I do wonder <laughs> yes. on what basis even. Like, as much as we'd glossed over at that point the actual transition between Alzec as bodyguard to Alzec as treacherous minion of gun to Alzec as admin specialist of of the school, on what what basis the royal family decided that he would make ideal bodyguard material? (laughs) Not on on a competency (laughs) basis, just on a trustworthiness (laughs) basis. By any point in season two, I completely um, agree with you. To, to be it honest, might have been a little bit tricky to, to hand wave away, um, but be that as it may, um, yeah, go I, on. I, th- I can answer that if you want, um, and 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 say that uh, in my head, you know, five six mm. years and whatever it was had pa- five years had passed. I guess at that point, part of my excuse back then for anything being different sure. was well, five years had mm-hmm. passed. A lot of things can happen. A lot of stuff can happen in five years. Uh, the idea was probably that the whole Alzac yeah. thing had been sorted out off screen, albeit. Uh, I know that it, retcon uh, you yourself fixed all of that, and we we cemented. All of that uh, in the Alzac story now is, is quite clear and. I mean, it may just be well, that nobody's paid close enough attention to find whatever plot holes um, are left in it. But um, I like if anyone would like to take up the challenge, I'm you know. Well, well, yes. I'm more than happy for the engagement. He has a book. He has a book full of information, ready to <laughs> to answer any yes, Alzac related yes, plot and consistency. I'm brain. sure of it. Um, uh, it goes off on yeah. tangents at times, but that's just, that's just a thing. It's all right, but but yeah. So basically, to to round that off, uh, the idea was that Alzac had um, had been forgiven by that point. Everyone knew that he wasn't really a bad guy, and I, I'm assuming that ninja brainwashing, at least in my version of the narrative at that point, mm. was not. Uh, it's you know, quite scoffed yeah. at thing. You're like, all right, yeah, ninja it's brainwashing. Quite a, it's quite not a normal fault. petty crime uh, in the ninja world, I assume, <laughs> and and it does. Your your uh, extra background there does uh, allude to the fact because it's it's not truly specified whether Alzac, you know, whether Alzac becoming a bodyguard in the original plan was uh, was part of his brainwashed assignment mm-hmm. or whether he was a genuine bodyguard who then got brainwashed. Um, it seems to imply that it was the latter, but uh, yeah. Um, what I was gonna sorry, I got briefly distracted by the the, the wonderful illustration of the um, of the skies of Arcadia draw distance. Um, when you see when you when you see any sweeping shots of the ships, you can see oh, yes, the, yes. the the detail of the three D model getting slowly better stage by stage as it gets closer. Um, but uh, sorry, um, yes. 
<laughs> it's quite all right. You know? uh, I will I will say one final thing about this, just because it is a bit of a, a, gold, a, a hidden gold mine. Um, those who have seen the footage in the scene that, uh, that that did survive, I do believe, if my memory is correct, that yes. uh, Dine and Leon. It's basically a fight between Dine and Leon. Um, and uh, the I, my my thoughts behind that, which never were obviously got fully formed or anything, were that. Um, Leon and he may, by extension in later scenes, were going to play a pivotal role in returning Dine to his original self, and Leon's sort of uh, best, you know, mm. way to do it was to, you know, speak with his fists, and uh, he, he he wanted to incur a fight between him and Dine, and that's why he's so antagonistic yeah. in that uh, particular bit, and um, yeah, because I believe the line is something, like, you know, it's this isn't a sparring match, Dine, it's to the death, you know, that he wanted to mm. kind of knock him back to his original self. That was. Leon's character at that point. I will be honest. As much as I, I, I am saddened that Leon is not as powerful mm. as I intended him to be in in the spinoff. I, I much prefer the direction that his character took um, in the story uh, than than I had planned in that particular. This is reminding me. Obviously, I'm now remembering all these wonder, well, quote unquote, wonderful ideas I had for for him coming back into the end of season two and possibly into a sort of season three fully formed dead men kind of mm. story with Leon as a regular um, yeah I, th- I think the direction that uh, the spin-off took oh, with him was, so was much better say, I mean numbers. who knows what, what uh, you know what alternative realities we could uh, could have ended up with shall we shall we say better we'll say int- more interesting more intriguing certainly because it was open and shut um, as far as I was right. concerned story wise of Leon simply being that Vegeta-esque anime rival at that point, so I much more prefer uh, I it's different saying, yeah. what uh, what we get from Leon in this spinoff. Anyway, so I, th- I think that mm-hmm. covers everything I can I can recall yeah. from that. No, I, I, um, um, particular endeavor. It's interesting to me because I, I, in the time you were talking, I've, I've wondered and then remembered why I didn't call on those unused Leon and Hime scenes for uh, the recut of, of season two uh, to try and you know to try and smooth over some of the cracks. Um, mm. I'm almost certain it would have been something that I might have attempted. Like, who, who knows whether I, whether I would have ended up uh, adding it back in or not, or whether it would have totally fitted with everything around it. Mm. The reason why I didn't even uh, consider it is because I that unused Hime Leon material is what I was going to attempt to butcher in order to create an extra couple of scenes for the Last Ninjas. Um, because, because, um, ah. uh, as I, I've probably said in some of the commentary material and, and so forth, uh, getting uh, Yasmin back to play Hime again wasn't possible. Um, but I did have her blessing to use any existing material, mm. um, and that meant that the only unused spoken word material of uh, of Yasmin as as Hime was in those unused season two scenes, and my intention was to repurpose them for. Uh, for uh, a short segment in Act 3 of The Last Ninjas. I can say, spoiler free, that's not happening now. Um, oh, right. I, I'm actually remembering this, and I do remember things that, that were to be added to that, which I won't go into detail on, obviously, because it's not happening. But um, the, I'm, I'm actually quite glad to hear that. That's the first time I've heard that, because I, I remember thinking... I don't know when it was, just you know, a couple, maybe a year or two ago or something. I kind of remembered that, and I thought... I don't know if that's going to work, but hey, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of glad to. Hear mm. It was a brave attempt, and I'm all. I will almost definitely release the attempted scene in some form at some point. But uh, yeah, it's it's not going into the final movie. Um, a, he, he, this doesn't mean he may won't appear on screen. Um, but uh, yeah, there there will be there will be no full scenes uh, involving her, sadly. Um, but uh, trust me when I say that. It's for the better. It was an interesting experiment trying to film new material around old material and crowbar the two together to make a cohesive scene. And I'm, I'm, I'm pleased enough with, or, or I'm interested enough by the result that I think it's it's probably worth preserving in some form, but not as part of the canonical story. Not as canon material, just as a, a nice little aside, like this was some material that was intended to go Correct. somewhere. Yeah. Um, but back onto the questions for you. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, the sudden disappearance of uh, of Halleck, who was uh, who was meant to carry the 
majority, if not the entirety, of, of season two on uh, on his back. Yes. Um, and by association, the fast forwarding to the the dispatch of Jin as the as the main villain. So, um, was the intention then that Jin's final fight would have been as as filmed, but simply placed later in the season and with more events leading up to it, or was there to be more of Jin after that fight as it as it was filmed? Uh, there was to be more, certainly more material. There were also there was also an additional student who I I think we've covered in the past. Mm-hmm. When we may have mentioned um, there was one day of filming with an actor which didn't go anywhere. Uh, it did have uh, Chris Tung as well. It just I don't know what it was, but there was something off. I think it was the costumes. Really? In that and well, that and the actor didn't uh, didn't come back. I've ever uh, seen or I probably you, heard you've never seen never this. Seen no, I, th- I actually I think I deleted it um, mm. like right after reviewing it in right. post. And it just didn't look good, um, and uh, you know, and nothing, nothing to say. The actor, you know, didn't do a good job. Really, it was just my my direction to them and the costuming and the the, the camera work. It, it like I know that it's nothing very stellar, but if you can suspend your disbelief for a moment, this was even worse than my usual outings back then with thing. And it just I can't remember exactly what it was, but it really didn't work for me. And I think that was when I slimmed the cast down because originally. For season two, there were meant to be three students in every team, and I think there were four teams, right? Because we had, Mm. it was to be Dine's team, which was uh, Halleck, L, and this additional student called uh, Kaido. I I was going to wonder, yes. Mm. I just want to say for the One Piece fans out there, the name doesn't come from One Piece. This is before Kaido was ever named in anything or or whatnot. Um, uh, It was actually from another anime, uh, which people may remember from, from the sort of early 2000s called Dinosaurs the Z in the middle mm. and the, the main sort of shonen character boy and that was called Kaido and I remember seeing that on TV one day and thinking Kaido is a cool name so that's uh, that's where that name it, came from it is a bit. cool name yeah, yeah. Like basically Ka- Kaido Kaido was going to be I, I, if we want to draw a parallel to an existing Ninjaverse character it would be, he'd be closest to Jaiku actually huh. uh, from the Ninja spinoff he was intended to be a lot more ninja like he dressed in black um, uh, and he had various stealth techniques and whatnot, but he he was very much mm. a, a Sasuke kind of caricature uh, without the kind of like v- vendetta revenge thing. He was he was mm. to be the cool guy, but not like Leon. And uh, he he had his whole thing was going to be Taijutsu. He was going to be specifically hand to hand combat more than anything it's else dangerous in a, um, in a series with uh, you know, think, with, with our level of, of uh, physical uh, stage combat and choreography, choreography. Um, yes this that may have lended to his his uh, sudden you know removal from all material I mean Joe was, was yeah. very keen on, on physical choreography as I remember um, and yes uh, that's very he, true yeah and he was one of the most Katashita, prolific yes. uh, uh, members of the villain cast and the hero cast. Now that I think about it, but and and the, yeah, yeah, and he, there you go. Not only did we we have him as a villain, but the moment we killed him off as a villain, we brought him back as a hero, <laughs> in a very bad stereotypical way. But hey, we live uh, in one. Always ready for another cup of Joe. Yep. <laughs> um, so, so basically, anyway. yes, <laughs> it's all right. No, it's fine. Um, I think that. Uh, uh, yeah, so to try and get as much of this information as I can out while we have time, um, and while I remember it, uh, they they were intended to be a, a triad trinity team of you know very sort of Naruto, Sakura, Sasuke kind of thing, with Dine being the sort of Kakashi equivalent. Mm. Uh, Dine was was very limited in appearances at that point beyond the sort of mentor, you know, reluctant mentor role of you know just getting the school fees paid and all, <laughs> all the rest of it. And, getting that sorted out. And then we had um, Galron's team. Originally, Saki, uh, Saki Sensei from the first episode, who doesn't appear again, she... Uh, did she make it into the, the, the now true canon version? She does, yes. Yeah, she's still in her existing episode. She exists. And I take it in the canon, we basically just say that she probably left the school off-screen to pursue other interests. Yeah, I mean, nothing is, nothing in you know, no remark is made about her, her disappearance. She just, uh, she just vanishes. I, um... Cool, cool. Uh, I, uh, I'll, I'll say this. I, um... I, I deleted the shot, um, of her getting a... You know how a lot of the cast get a character bio in episode one? Um... 
Ah, uh, yes. Just a brief little one on, on the screen. Um, among the alterations I made to episode one, I, I deleted her character bio, sh- the shot that has her character bio in it, so as not to infer greater significance to her than is right. long-term given. And also because she's a heavy drinker and her bio says she's 17. So I, I, I thought that was probably best just... just I, w- I would like to add to, to that, just in our defense, that in the UK it was perfectly legal uh, at that age. That is also at true. The time, yes. At the time, it was okay. I, I think the law has changed since then. But, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a drinker, so it's never been. Well, neither am I, and me. it's. But I just, I just thought, remember reading. Yeah, yeah. I thought for our international viewers, it might be best if we just left that ambiguous. Um, yes. Anyway, that was an aside to an aside. Carry on. I, no, that's that's very good. Of course, we could just say it's magic ninja juice, but she's not really drunk. But they they think they think it is. Anyway, no. <laughs> In order, we've got all we've got a whole bag of tricks here ready for this sort of thing. Absolutely. No. Um, no. Uh, yeah, Saki was originally meant to be a student under Galron. It was going to be Falker, Heathcliff, and Saki, uh-huh. uh, and they were the, the the sort of the the you know that was their their thing there, and um, they were as they were. And she she was uh, supposed to be a um, a drunk boxer. Yes, that was a drunken boxer. That was her character. Um, then we had Jin's team, which was. Uh, and I get this. This is. <laughs> I just remember. That we all may know a character who wasn't didn't seem to be part of a team in um, in season two, and there's of course Mime Samuelson. Mm. Or Samuels. Did, what's his official name now? It's Mime Samuels, Samuels, yeah. Samuels. It, I remember in first cut it was Samuelson, but I guess Samuels is his official name now. Mime Samuels it was was originally meant to be in Jin's team hmm. alongside Ray and Alif Baron. Um, and uh, so there was there was three of them in each. And uh, I do believe there was a team for Alzec at one point, but it was only ever on paper, and I realized at that point there was no way I was going to get additional cast enough to do this um, hence why we also slimmed down the teams uh, for, for the other the other teams there hmm. um, I sketched out a, a character who used oh, this is this is really scraping the bottom of the barrel here uh, I think it was a, a character who used uh, different footwear but it was I deemed it too similar to Falker with his ninja of fashion thing I think he would put on different shoes uh, and he like went boots, sneakers, that kind of thing, and mm-hmm. they would do different things depending on what footwear they were wearing. And they obviously had kicks as their 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 ability. Um, another person was just straight up a fire chakra user. They they used like fire techniques, and, and I don't think I ever delved too much into them. And mm-hmm. I just I think I think the names were Ruby. Yeah, that was Ruby. Uh, the the and then the last one was an earth technique user, and it was. Grand was his name. Uh, yeah, that was it. Grand. Uh-huh. Um, who was the other one? Who was, who was the, the other guy? The foot, the, the foot ninja. No, the the, the shoe ninja. Uh, Co- Cobalt. That was it. They were all kind of. They were supposed to all be minerals, but then Grand Granite. Granite didn't seem to work for me, or something like that. And mm-hmm. that was the team working under Alzac. I think it was minerals because Alzac obviously had the, the Iron Stance Jutsu. Yes. And I wanted him to be training. You know, a team based on like mineral style techniques or something, and Ruby was going to be like trying to merge solid, like create a solid burning rock or something like yes. that with technique. Can, there was lots of fun little ideas there. You can tell how much traction these ideas gained because I have no idea about any of this. <laughs> oh no, th- this is this is stuff from before I even probably spoke to you about season two, mm. um, which which got bimmed right away because there was a movie instead of season two. It was going to be just Chris. Um, Ruby, uh, two of the other characters, and, and someone who was going to be played by Andrew Dykes, who then went on to play Jin. I recycled the sort of villainous character, but not the techniques, uh, into into Jin later. Maybe the tele- telekinetic limbs survived, or something like that. Or I see. <laughs> it was, but yeah, there, there was a lot of brainstorming going on, and I've, I've all of this talk of season two has reminded me of these paper ideas that I had, but uh, the idea of Elzek training a team of mineral-based ninjas uh, <laughs> so, sounds quite amusing. Yes, the mineral-based, great. The, the training, more questionable, but uh, there we are. Um, yeah. I uh, No, I think I think it's... Uh, um, I, I, mean, I, th- I think 
as the as the season goes on, I think what what helps you not to to tally up the uh, you know the actual uh, how how the teams are populated in in your head is perhaps how um, I've I've heard this mentioned recently that uh, that a lot of the students seem to to take on more responsibilities than than typical students, uh, particularly the more advanced ones. Um, yes. Such as you know, me may being effectively sat at the the staff table in, in episode one and 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 L. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, and then you've got, uh, I, I think probably Elif is is. Um, I think you're really, yeah, Elif is the is probably the most ambiguous of all because she clearly talks to Dine like a student, but she's also the school counselor. Yes, yes, the, it. I, I I agree with that. They it's. I, I imagine these would be senior students, possibly mm. in their final final, you know, state of, of ninja training or whatnot, who are able to to talk to them on a more you know adult you know a more close person to person level rather sure. than a student and teacher relationship. Yes. I think the the idea, barring all comedy, the, the the instance of sending like Heathcliff on his own to go and fight Deadnin at their base. Mm. You know, let's let's just for a moment pretend it wasn't done for giggles and just because we could. I imagine if we wanted to take that as a serious note, that they had genuine faith in Heathcliff's ability to at least survive. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, during yeah, that, especially given that Dine, you know, gets almost killed by by Katashido alone, mm. and uh, and Heathcliff does exceptionally well just because of the way his ninja techniques work against uh, Katashido's. So there you go. Yes. Um. Ah, but there we are. Um, so, uh, just to corner the one disparate little hanging detail from from back there, because you uh, you've you've oh, nicely right, circ- you've one. nicely circumvented my my need to even ask the question that I had written down and everything for who was to be the final member of Team Four because they were they were referenced on uh, on camera even if uh, yeah even if like you say all but the yes they were a prison right. they were they were in jail that was it you know? yes that was the, that was the thing was Kaido. yeah so Kaido was, was a was a prisoner of some kind presumably in their little cage yes in the in that little cage which we'll just say that there are many little cages at the front all looking exactly the same but in a different place that was my only follow up question because yeah he, he specifically says release that prisoner not the prisoner <laughs> that, <laughs> that prisoner that implying prisoner. a group of prisoners i'm hoping they weren't all kept in the same cage together it's uh, no that would be not spacious. very wrong <laughs> <laughs> um good good Right, I think it's time to give someone else a shout again. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, yes, after that, after that long diatribe, um, let me hop over to uh, a question from Gokai Platinum. Uh, so they say, they say I tend to use ADR to cheat my way around not having good on-site audio recordings, but I want to improve that front. Uh, what mic setup do you use for outdoor filming? I think that's actually from Kaelin Kiyosuke. Um, is it? Beg your pardon. Sorry, Gokai Platinum is so. written after it, but I presume that that's actually probably meant to be on the next line. Uh, yeah, um, the questions that come after the names are the... Yeah, sorry, so worry. as the very first question I, I read, this one is also from Kaelin Kiyosuke. Um, no, I'll, I'll answer this one here. Hmm. Um, well, basically, uh, here's the thing. ADR is your best friend when you're a, a filmmaker in any regard. In fact, I just want to, for those of you who don't know this, um, when you're watching a movie in the cinema, like an actual professional movie or watching something on TV, it's been ADR'd. Mm. No, no question about it. it. Like, there might be some shots where they have just happened to use some on-site boom audio yes. or something, but by and large, everything you hear is ADR. You, it, it's very unlikely that there would be some real sound, especially in fantasy films, um, yes. that you would actually hear that have been captured. I say real sound that's been captured on the day. Hmm. Highly unlikely. Probably um, the only one is, the, uh, is the, the early 2010s version of Les Miserables, which they advertised as having been sung and, and performed on set. And that was a very heavy part of their marketing. But everything else... Oh, right. Everything else, solid ADR. <laughs> right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that then. There you go. That's... <laughs> That's fine, but yeah. So ADR is your best friend uh, in any regards when you're you're doing audio. Hmm. Um, uh, to improve uh, an actual mic setup for outdoor filming, because we certainly did do that. My best advice to you is to get, if your camera does take it, an XLR input uh, microphone, um, which plugs into your your onboard camera, um, and to 
get as close as you can without compromising your shot and get your actors to be as loud and clear as you can and to be very aware of your surroundings when filming if it has to be on, on the day audio. Now we, I say we, I, I dub over um, everything pretty much uh, dialogue-wise. It is a bit more noticeable than, than a professional-grade film would be, given given our, our status as a not-professional yeah. yet uh, group. But, um, no, it, it's... It, you also get the chance to, to go back and to reevaluate the performance that was there on the day and give a much more solid um, bit of dialogue into, into what you're doing. So my advice is to simply continue doing ADR, but do it right and do it well, um... In a, in a proper recording environment. It makes all the difference. It does add days onto your work, honestly, but um, the final product will be all the better for it. I guarantee that. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so yeah. Yes. Nice. Okay. Um, so having just robbed Gokai Platinum of uh, their questions, oh, I think jump I'm into another one straight away. Like, oh, ahead. yes. Yeah, I'll, uh, let's... Uh, so what do they want? Say. Oh, uh, they'd like to ask who is uh, Rie San? Does that, does that ring a bell? Oh, Rie San. Rie San, beg um, your pardon. Um, and, uh, and can she do a reaction to the Apple Plush uh, from previous works? Well, I can answer the second part of that. Uh, we have done a, an Apple Plush, the Apple King uh, re- reaction uh, video in our newly added by our marketing team mm-hmm. uh, shorts on YouTube. I'm going to be honest and say I was against that from the beginning. I hate those, but I'm glad you're all loving them. Uh, some of them have in fact had several hundred percent more views than some of my, my what I considered my best works, scripted months of work going into them. Mm-hmm. And a video of someone's shoe as I've done them. <laughs> but they're in one day rather than, you know, Years of See? being live, but let's move. Let's move on from my. No, no, my no! Don't let's move on. Dine had the right idea. Alzac was trying to explain, you know, the actual plot of season one. Dine was more interested in his shoe. Dine had the right idea. Dine had the right idea. Let's just film a shoe. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so we've done that uh, Apple reaction video for you. We hope you enjoyed it, um, and we can say that uh, Rie Sun is um, my ex Japanese teacher. Because um, I uh, used to take Japanese uh, classes, <laughs> so there you go. And she also plays uh, Rouge Metal in um, in All Across. For those of you who who may not notice, because of her mechanical eye patch thing that she wears in that, she's. If you want to count her painting in the in the Crushing Dream, she has a high level of screen time, probably mm. that varies uh, that compares to that of the main cast. Yes, uh, <laughs> but we never we never hear her speak. Always so, good to give the spotlight to another uh, one of your alumni. Mm. Excellent. There we go. Um, and uh, I haven't read it, so I don't know if it's a follow-up question. But Gokai Platinum has one other thing to say. Uh, they ask: I noticed the Kaiser Ank has uh, a somewhat Naruto-looking spiral on one side of it. Was the pendant in particular chosen due to that spiral? I said I know the answer to this, but you carry on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm correct. To, to, I, to I, I thought I knew the answer, and I did. To, to flesh out, um, that is a happy coincidence that you have just pointed out to us by giving us this question. Uh, no, no way was that ever planned because that uh, Kaiser Ank, the Ank, that was it was a gift from from uh, believe it or not, Andrew Dykes who played Jin. Uh, <laughs> Kaiser Ank is a gift from Jin. Um, and is that the original uh, original Kaiser Ank? That's the original Kaiser Ank. Yeah. Right, so because I ha- I have a Kaiser Ank. You ha- uh, you have a replica Kaiser Ank. Yes, I do. You have to get a hold of. It's not even that good a replica. <laughs> Hey, hey, it worked. It's just um, metallic yeah. and ank shaped. Um, well, well, yeah, like most anks would be. Yeah, the, uh, the original yeah. Kaiser ank has gone to uh, Gokai Platinum, and that's how they were able to notice this uh, spiral mm. on it. They have, they have that prop. I'm glad it went to a, a home where it's loved and looked after. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, that's. It was a complete coincidence. And now that you've mentioned it, I do think about the sort of Naruto swirly leaf spiral or the spirals on their their shoulders that they wear and that kind of thing so yeah mm, quite very nice good um, now uh, how are we doing for time incidentally oh we're not, we're not bad at all 20 minutes yeah. okay okay um, alright so uh, so one thing that uh, okay so this is kind of following on from, from Kaylin's original question uh, so she asks which character is your favorite from your works that you did not play 
Uh, oh, sorry. So there we go. Yes, yeah, sorry. So not from outside of your works, but from within your works, but by played by someone else. Favorite character. Um, again, as I've said before, this could change on a daily basis depending on who's in my head at the moment. But um, mm-hmm. we will go to say that my favorite character out of all them I didn't play currently, and this might shock you all, is um, Professor Polonius Plato from uh, X Save, the game saving hero. Mm-hmm. An excellent choice. Uh, and um, you, you you can't hear it unfortunately because the audio was lost to us uh, but there is a bit in the blooper reel slash unused footage reel whatever it is that we, we posted up uh, after X-Save was released where I think it's I think Gus Gustavo Gonzalez and I are sitting um, at the table where Plato sits and it was just after we'd done all of his insert lines that he has like shirt change and Round one, fight, and all that kind of thing. I sat there and I, I, I told him with the camera running to the things that he was my favorite character that I've that I've uh, not played basically. Well, not not, not played, you know, that I'd, that I'd added into a works. Yes. And um, I, I think it was because when I was uh, writing him, he reminded. Me, now this is not how he was portrayed, but I have a huge love for for Digimon. Just in case all of you hadn't figured that out from the copious amount of Digimon music in the Ninja Days. Um, but I really love Etamon. For those of you who remember Etamon, the sort of monkey Elvis yes. Digimon. Now, I know he's not the favorite of many people, yourself included, sir. Uh, <laughs> but I really like Etamon. And when I was scripting um, uh, him out, in my head, I was hearing Etamon's voice uh, doing it. And uh, for whatever reason, that has led to my, my decision that he is my favorite. <laughs> so... There you go. Spiritually, he's at him on to you. Um, but I loved the way that Gus played the professor on the day and uh, wouldn't have given that role to anyone else. Mm-hmm. So he is he is my favorite character, definitely from Max Save and um, probably from, and definitely at the moment from all of my works that Fair I've not enough. played. I really loved... I don't uh, want uh, Etamon fans uh, with the, within the audience to feel too spurned. Like, when I say when I say Etamon's not my favourite character, I, that's correct, but it's a, it's in a passive way, it's not in a sardonic way, you know, I just, like, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. carry any dislike for him, he's, he's perfectly serviceable. Who, and who was... Who was it? Sorry, I'm sorry, everyone. I have to find this out go since on, it's on topic. Who was it that you really didn't like from the first season of Digimon? Who was a villain? I remember you, you even used a curse word when you described him. This is years ago, so yeah. I forgive you. But oh. you, you just said, you know, they're all fine except for who's a bit. I don't. I don't know. It I, was I, one of the Dark Masters. Was um, it one of the Dark Masters? So who are they? they it definitely Pidemon, wasn't Piedmon because you love Piedmon. Uh, Puppetmon and who's the other one? Puppetmon. It was Puppetmon. Did I hate Puppetmon? Well, what was I at thinking? least I'd like. I I'd, just like, I, I, maybe I did. I don't I'd like. I, I, okay. At the time, um, at the time, I remember we were talking yeah. about Digimon villains and how awesome Piedmon was, yeah. and then. For, I, I was talking about Etamon, and you just sort of looked at me and were like, okay, well, fair enough, you can like him I if you like want. I do like Piedmon, that is true. Um, but, yeah. uh, no, if I, I, like, if I had my head screwed on, or maybe if I'd, maybe if I'd actually watched it properly, because, you know, at the time I was only catching whatever episodes I happened to be exactly. in the house for yeah. whenever it was on telly in the old days. But, um, no, if I'd, if I'd managed to watch through the Dark Masters arc, Properly, then I think I would have had to conclude that by far the worst is Metal Seedramon because they simply didn't have the budget to animate him properly. Um, oh right! Oh, I didn't know that. Every time they tried to make him snake like a serpent, it looks rubbish and jittery. And all the other times, he's kind of coiled up and bouncing along on his tail. I seem to remember. Wow! I, I, I remember the whole segment like, where he's like hovering above the beach, coiled up and like they teetering along <laughs> on his tail or something. Like, this is way, way off topic. Um, anyway. Uh, Sorry, everyone. Right, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll talk about this later. Digimon's good. Important. That's, 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 the, that's the takeaway. Um, Have fun. Right. Um, anywho. Uh, no, we re- actually, we do need to go to go back, because uh, what I hadn't realised, if I'd done any of the reading before, is that Kaylin's questions actually mostly link together one to t'other. So let's try and get through the stream. Uh, so you've said your favourite yes. character to play. You've said your favourite character... No- that you say favorite character that you didn't play, not not favorite character for the reason that you didn't play them, but um, right, right. out of those two characters in a battle, who would win? Uh, uh, Lord Ravishing, Etamon. Or... No, no. <laughs> sorry, 
Sorry, everyone. Uh, so it was Lord Ravishing and Professor Polonius Plato. <laughs> Who wins? Professor Polonius Plato wins. You have decided. Hands down. Lord Ravishing summons uh, a dark breaker from the gap between worlds. Uh, it drives its way towards Professor Plato. The drill's spinning away, and Professor Plato sidesteps it, and it misses, and it explodes. And then Professor Plato jumps on a pixelated bike and chases Lord Ravishing around an American country... No, no, not country park. An American park. Uh, sure. And Ravishing hits his head off a slide as he tries to duck under it because he's misjudged the gap because he's got hat on and all the rest of it. Hmm. And then falls down dead. And Plato wins. Nice. Um, and that's it. And uh, Caelan's uh, final probing question, which uh, kind of comes on the tail of all of that, which is uh, also, hypothetically, with infinite time and resources, are there any characters you wanted to have return in all across that could not have? How long have you got? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, that's not a cop out answer. I'm just like, infinite time and resources. All of them. Yeah. Every single one. Even the map salesman from Lyrium. And I want to point out someone has told me that they they mis- that they believe that the returning character played by Elliot Eldersmith, sorry, Elliot Smith, mm. when he when he originally worked with us, and there's Elliot Eldersmith who's married. Um, uh, they uh, they thought that was the map salesman. I can understand why you would think that. He is wearing the same, same hat, hat, which is yeah. also Galron's hat, his Galahat. Mm-hmm. Um, or one of his Galahats. But uh, mm-hmm. um, that is, he is Rally on the Ranch Farmer. I just want to make sure everyone knows that that's who he's playing in that scene. I'm going to say, my, my head cannon, uh, which is actually a pun I've now realised, uh, my head cannon for that hat is uh, that it's actually Galron's hat and that it's simply being passed around because Galron never has to worry about losing that hat. He can recall it at any time. Yes, hat recall. He can... Literally Even from miles away, anytime. I've just Doesn't decided matter where it is. Yep, it works. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, good. I'm glad. <laughs> glad to to <laughs> expose the uh, the doppelganger in there who only merely has to wear the same corduroy hat. Um, yep. To uh, to pull off a full to disguise. To pass to someone else. Exactly. Well, well, that is something we did have a, a track record of doing back in the day. We just sort of put a hat on someone and said they were a different person. Yes. Otherwise. Completely altered character. It's the palette swap. You yes. Put a different hat on them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right. Have I got anything that we can use to help fill out the remaining time? I think the, uh, we've, we've pulled the ninja apart plenty for... Uh, Oh gosh, yes. I, I, we keep coming back. Well, to be fair, it is still the only unfinished and still live yeah, living yes, work. And by far the largest of any. Um, okay, um, let's let's visit Zoologic. Um, no. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was junk the stream and, and visit uh, Zoologic. No. Um, I don't think I've got the book anymore. No. <laughs> Can you no, uh, recall and tell us about the journey of the design of the Zoologic uh, Clock Tower? Because I know... Is there more to this that you know? Are you asking um, this question knowing something that I don't? Only a tiny bit, but I'm assuming that there is at least some some that I don't know about. Because um, there is the final version of the Zoologic Clock Tower is not how it looked uh, in, the, in the modelling stages. Oh, I know what you're talking about now. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, so the journey in the design. Firstly, I wanted it to look like a clock tower, because it's a clock tower. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, heavily inspired by Majora's Mask, those of you who've seen Please Save My Tomorrows and know about it, um, uh, the idea that in Majora's Mask, in Legend of Zelda, uh, you've got a giant clock in the centre of the aptly named Clock Town, and it's quite an amazing structure. In fact, you could say it is the very centre of the entire game, mm. which it is, figuratively and literally. Um, the clock itself really stood out to me as a kid and as an adult uh, going on later. I really, to this day, like that clock. In fact, to be honest, despite the fact I'm trying to downsize and make as much space for new props for filming, etc., as, as I am, if there was one piece of memorabilia that doesn't exist that I would like to add to my room, it would probably be a clock that looked like that, that functioned as an actual clock. Yes. Um, I would really like something. I must, I must engage in, maybe I could build that. Mm. Anyway, uh, sidetracked. So... Basically, I built 
the clock tower, which is the, the tower base, which is what you see out of uh, paper mache and cardboard, which mm-hmm. you see in in the show itself. And I put that together as is. But then um, I had this foam ring that I bought from the craft shop, and uh, I wanted it to match the time ring sort of light blue, see, see clear crystal blue color nice. that, the, that Tripp's time ring had. And I painted it that same kind of blue. And it, I think it was like a, a juice bottle or something that I'd cut the top off that I used as the mount. And I, I paper mache the the ring to the top of it, and I put it on. And I put sort of ancient symbol numbers around it, mm. uh, which were meant to be obviously clock numbers and everything like that. But uh, what then happened was I put it on the green screen to film, uh, to, to, to take photos of and, and film, mm-hmm. and I did. And I realized all of a sudden that light blue disappears very quickly in chroma green. And I sort of yeah. shot myself in the foot. And I didn't know much about still image editing at all back then. It was all done in, in, um, in video edit. And uh, I decided that I couldn't use the top of it at all. So, given that I was really pushing a release date that I'd already you know, mentioned and everything back then, that was when I really started my, you know, we will start this on this day, we will get it done by this day. Mm. Um, uh, I really wanted to get it done and out, and then uh, I looked. We had my grand's old grandfather clock in the house, not on a wall, unused, and it was just there. And so I took photos of that, and I just overlaid that over the over the tower itself, and uh, that's what happened. And so I just merged two images together because the the top. So that image, the, the tower that you're seeing, the rest of that image does still have the original clock. You just don't see it because it's been cropped out. Hmm. And overlaid with a with a an actual real life grandfather clock. That's it. Yes, yeah, see that that's the part out or the the two bits that I wasn't aware of there. Um, I I never saw it um, when it reached the stage of you uh, adding symbols to the clock. I only saw it with the uh, with the foam ring. They um, were really rubbish symbols. They didn't really show up well on the, camera. Ah, well, who can say? But um, uh, yes, yeah, so I, I saw the foam ring uh, added, but I didn't see it decorated at all, and I didn't know that the final change in the design happened because the green screen kneecapped it. Um, yeah. But so was the, um, had uh, had that not been the case, um, was the idea to add any any moving parts to the clock face in post or would it simply have been uh, a static image? It simply would have been a static image. Because <laughs> um, it, did, it did seem like, um, I mean, obviously a, a clock moves a, a, a quite a sluggish pace anyway so would it have really been been discernible but the idea of, of yeah. having I think one the, of the very the, the idea with sorry go on. sorry oh, <laughs> the, the idea sorry to, to answer your question there. Um, the idea with with the clock tower is the, and, and like the rest of please anything can be static at any time hmm. um, and uh, it really should read the right time of day I don't know if it always did uh, to be honest with you, uh, looking back at the edits. Well, now. let me be honest. In return, I never checked. Uh, you know, in my watching, I, it never it never occurred to me to actually look at what the face of the clock was was showing time wise. Reading. Um, mm. Yeah, I did, it just I just viewed it as the big set piece in the middle of the town. There you go, fans. There's a new game for you all to play. Why clock don't you watch. go have a, a marathon of <laughs> it's, it's clock watch? Uh, check out, see if those times match what you think looks like that time of day. Mm-hmm. Yep. So there you go. And, once you've done that, for God's sake, don't go and watch any scene from the Ninja spin-off or, or any stuff from this time productions that has a clock in it. Uh, you'll have a feeling. By the day. way, speaking of the last ninjas, uh, <laughs> I noticed there's a clock in one particular. No, I won't mention it. No. Oh no, 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 no! Because oh, I, like it's not. I, I won't spoil in what capacity, but there are loads of clocks in Act Three, not in any central role, but uh, yeah, just when you see all those clocks, as you will. Just know they're all broken. Um, okay. Uh, is this to is this to try and clear up something that may have happened clockwise in other clockwise <laughs> in other? Um, no. Or is it not related? No, to it's not. It's not a no. It's not a retcon. It's not addressing anything. It's just uh, it's just a visual set piece where where I I liked the idea of using clocks as a um, as a visual kind of join the dots shorthand to relate things together. Um, I needed a. B- okay. I'm trying not to stray into actual spoilers here, but there's a. Okay, right. There you say no more. No, no, I, no, I, I want I'm, to be surprised. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm on my I'm on my bike. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so okay, there, okay. There are a bunch of physical objects in in the Last Ninjas Act Three that I needed to 
become clear upon just glancing at them that they were all related in some yes. way. And so I decided each of them had a clock face on it. For Again, for practical mm-hmm. reasons I won't go into here. But um, all the clocks inevitably end up showing different times from one another. So ignore that bit. It's just the fact that they have clocks on them. The time is not important and they're all broken anyway in canon. Got it. Okay, no, mm-hmm. that's that's great, and I, I'm just to let everyone know I'm well aware the footage has just run out, but we are going to wrap this up properly. I just want to quickly say, so that means that either the clock it, when in act when Alzac meets uh, Gauntlet um, Junior, Junior Two, uh, in uh, I forgot, I've forgotten his full name. I'm, I apologize. Is it William James Cedric Gauntlet point. the Ninth? Uh, William James Cedric Gauntlet the Ninth. Uh, so uh, that's the that's that's the original gauntlet, or the, that's the uh, spin-off gauntlet. That's uh, William James Cedric Gauntlet the Third. This is uh, oh the third, right? Sorry, yeah. William James Cedric Gauntlet the Third, and and uh, Charles, Charles Anthony Francis Gauntlet the Ninth. Charles Anthony Francis Gauntlet the Ninth. That's the one. that's the one from uh, the last yes. Ninjas. Yeah, got it. Well, in it, when El, when Alzac uh, visits him in his secret hideout, mm. safe room base, uh, I've noticed that. So Alzac. Uh, while well, he's talking to him, must and they must have stood completely still for at least twenty three hours and fifty five minutes because at one point uh-huh. five minutes is taken off the clock uh, later in the conversation. Exactly. So either that clock is running the wrong way or <laughs> they stood still. I for... think the mistake that you've made there is assuming that it's a clock that you're looking at because that room is full of gauntlets, gadgets, and and tinkering. Ah, I see. So, so that's it's not really a clock. A very that's a, a, that's a, that's from his you know uh, deadly weapons disguised as oh, harmless objects. Oh, the deadly. This is range. the professor's deadly weapons disguised as exactly. harmless objects. Exactly. He managed range. to Got he it. managed to pinch that out of his stores uh, before you know preparing to to leave the ship, or possibly he had an extra you know a, a secondary supply uh, that mm. he went and and uh, and harvested before this new before finding this new little home base, and that is right. a very cunningly disguised weapon. Got it. What is it? Uh, it's a spoilers. <laughs> right, got it. Now I'm going to work that into Act 3 now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, marvellous. Well, well I'm, I'm glad we were able to cover that essential point of, <laughs> yeah. of information. This has been Clock well, Watch. Um, it has. Enjoy, enjoy the clocks, folks, uh, in all their forms, regardless of what show they show up in. Hmm. Um, we're coming to... Well, we're, we're past the end, but we yes. a bit of bonus we're, time we're for you all. We're abusing the concept of the while. end. So that's fine, and uh, I, ju- I just want to say this is a, a time to wrap up. We do, we do have. Um, you, you will have all noticed that uh, the marketing team have decided to release uh, *Common Rider Fake* episode one, and I can mm. confirm here that you can look forward to the remaining five episodes now uh, being publicly available uh, over the next five weeks. So, um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to see it or or haven't been subscribed to the Patreon page. Uh, you, you are now will now be able to publicly view those. So uh, uh, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that uh, you you do some thinking and it's some good food for thought. On a lighter note and on a a much more fun note series-wise, we have, of course, from This Time Productions coming, we have The Last Ninjas, Final Act, which is coming coming soon. Always coming soon. Coming soon, definitely. Uh, It really is soon, Mm -hmm. I'm told. So there we go. Who told you that? uh, I don't think they knew what they were talking about. Someone involved in the creation process of it who who sounds a lot like you, but must have been someone else. (sighs) If we, if we know anything about the ninjas, is that it's just because somebody looks and sounds like somebody else doesn't mean it was the same person. Precisely. So there we go. Anyway, thank you all for joining us as usual and uh, look forward to the next Q&A episode. So do send those questions in. If you don't, we'll just have to come up with our own. So yep. there we go. They will be long-winded. All the best. <laughs> Take care. Metal Seed Ramon. <laughs>